It was, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, up next, we have Mike here from Ionic. Uh, people here, who have, who's heard of Ionic? A lot of people. Wow. Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Mike here first spoke at PhoneGap Day US in 2014. It was a great talk. Uh, glad to have you back up here. Uh, and he's talking about Ionic 2, I believe. So take it from here, Mike. All right. Uh, so yeah, like I said, my name's Mike. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how we're going to make developers happy. Uh, we have a pair of Ionics. We now have Bionics. Um, so in case you guys didn't know, Ionic is a pretty popular open source framework. Um, and it just doesn't do anything uh, crazy. It just provides you with all these components that you need, right? So everything to start making phone gap apps and make them really well, uh, Ionic provides all that. So anything that you could get from a native SDK, it's in there. Uh, and because it's all web technology and Angular underneath, it's super easy to uh, customize and hack and make your own. <coughs> and we've been hard at work uh, on Ionic 2. And that's kind of what this is going to be about, but at a much higher level. Um, but quickly about Ionic 2. It's essentially everything we've learned in the past two years of building Ionic 1. Uh, we've taken all these lessons that we learned, what worked, what could have been improved, uh, swapping out Angular 2, uh, Angular 1 for Angular 2. So if anyone didn't like that Angular.controller syntax and dollar scope, you can be happy. That's all gone. Um, <clears throat> and it's all built on top of ES6. Uh, and so if you've ever done any Ionic development before, you know, not much has changed. It's pretty uh, simple to get up and running. You know, MP install to get the CLI package. And then when you want to start a project, it's same command that you're used to, uh, but it's just behind a dash dash v2 flag. And we can finally build apps with like ES6, uh, you know, all these new features that we keep hearing about. We can actually start using it now. Um, <clears throat> if you want to use TypeScript, which is a great option for larger teams, uh, we ship with an option to be able to use that as well. So we can finally say bye-bye ES5. Uh, but I'm going to be sad a little bit. ES5 was easy. Uh, how do you add a library in ES5? Just add a script tag and you're fine. Let's call it a day. Um, how about building and bundling and minifying all your assets? Um, you got grum, gulp or grunt, and you know, you're done. Not much overhead. Uh, so ES6 was really, uh, ES5 was really easy. You know, minimal overhead of how to set everything up. Uh, we've had the same syntax for years, and this is stuff that everyone knew. Uh, and it may not seem like a big deal, but everything was global. So as soon as that script tag was loaded, you can reference it wherever you want. Uh, <clears throat> And that's not the case with ES6. You know, ES6, everything's changed. And while some of it is for the better, there's a lot of new things that you know, developers are going to get tripped up over. You know, there's not 100% browser support. We have to deal with ES6 modules. It's kind of a pain. So when you are a new user, new user and you're trying to develop an ES6 app, you're going to hit a few walls. So what do you have to consider? Uh, language support, first off. Um, like I said, ES6 is still being added to all these browsers. And no browser has 100% ES6 support. Um, and chances are, you're probably going to need to transpile to actually hit all your targets, especially on mobile. Um, and some popular options for this transpilation step are things like Babel, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Tracer from Google, uh, all these different compile options. What's the difference between Babel and Tracer? I don't know. And I mentioned TypeScript. So if you guys don't know what TypeScript is, uh, it's essentially ES6 plus a little ES7 and this optional static typing. Um, so this definitely needs to be transpiled. Uh, 
and thankfully, there is uh, one transpiler for this. So there is a TypeScript compiler that comes uh, with the entire language, and that's fine. So you kind of can't avoid a build step. Uh, using ES6 and TypeScript, you, you need to transpile, which is fine, but something that you need to consider. So I mentioned modules. Uh, modules are kind of, you know, they're good, but they're also pretty tough. Uh, so modules now replace everything being on the global, which is really good. Uh, we don't want to pollute the global scope, so we now have a proper module system. And if you've done anything with no development, you're probably used to seeing uh, CommonJS, AMD, UMD, System.Register. Who knows what the difference between any of those module formats are? Exactly. Thankfully, ES6 has come to save us, and we do have an ES6 module format, but no way to actually load modules natively in the browser. I don't know. So there are different specs out there for this, and you can polyfill uh, module loading. Uh, you can use uh, some things like uh, System.js, if you guys have heard of that. What it, what it will do is polyfill the uh, browser's native, um, the browser's uh, module loading, and at the same time, uh, and load everything asynchronously. Or you could use something like a build, uh, build step, like Browserify, Webpack, Rollup. Who knows what the difference between those three are? One person. So we have different options between all of these tools, and one person knows the difference. ES6. So that's another thing you have to worry about, and that's not good. So let's take a quick, quick uh, recap. We have all these new language features. So we have to understand uh, the ES6 syntax, proper lexical scoping, because that will trip people up. We have to consider browser support. We have to worry about how do we load all of our modules. And then, finally, we can actually build our app. That's not great. I do not want to build apps like that. Uh, an ES6 workflow is so complex compared to what we've been used to for the past few years. And you know, as an experienced dev, this can be pretty painful, but you can kind of you know, power through it. But if you're a new developer or if you're just new to JavaScript in general, this is crazy. So with Ionic 2, uh, we really have been sitting around, uh, sitting around and looking at all the different options out there and trying to find something that everyone can agree upon. It may not be the best or most popular solution. It may not be you know, what's number one on Hacker News, but it's something that people can use and build with. So out of the box, uh, we, are transpiler we have transpilers for TypeScript and ES6. We provide you with a module loader, and we give you the build process so that way all of this is taken care of for you without you having to think. And it's really a nice little uh, nice magic between our CLI and Webpack. So who has ever used Webpack before? Yeah, a few people. <laughs> so I'll go over Webpack in a bit. But you as a developer, once you create that Ionic 2 project, if you choose TypeScript or ES6, it doesn't matter. It'll already be taken care of for you. Um, you want to extend it and you know, maybe attach a linting process, you can do that as well. It's super configurable. So let's kind of talk about Webpack. Because as a tool, it really, can, it really deserves its own like hour talk. Because it has so many features in it that it can be a little overwhelming, but it provides them all these. Uh, provides the most flexibility out of everything. 
So Webpack, what it will do is, <clears throat> once it's instantiated, it'll actually stand, uh, statically analyze all your code. So if you have things in your node modules that you are requiring, if you have local modules that you are trying to import, um, at build time, it'll go out, fetch everything, and bundle everything into a giant uh, ES5 file. Uh, and if you are big into testing, or maybe you want to attach some linting, uh, the pro it's super easy to just include that in there and have it all run while it's still handling compilation. <clears throat> and Webpack kind of works on this concept of loaders. Now, you don't have to know a whole lot about loaders. Um, frankly, I don't know a whole lot about loaders, but I know enough to know that they just interface with that transpiler. So I give uh, Webpack a loader and a bunch of files. It does its own magic. I get ES5 goodness back. Uh, but they also allow for pre and post uh, compilation steps. So maybe you want to attach, like, say, Karma uh, before you actually compile and you want to test all your ES6 code. Well, you can do that. And then afterwards, you could attach another test process to figure everything else out once it gets compiled down. And so we chose to use a TypeScript uh, loader for this. So we can compile ES6 from the TypeScript uh, loader, or from the TypeScript compiler. And we chose to use this single option for uh, an important reason. When you're trying to debug an issue, not only do you have to figure out what their issue is in their code, what could be going wrong in their build step, what's their environment, you have to figure out how are they actually going from ES6 or TypeScript now to ES5. This makes, this is one less thing to worry about. Now that you have a single loader that's working across all these different, uh, both platforms, everything should just be easy. Um, and the TypeScript loader actually allows you to turn off static ch uh, type checking for JavaScript files. So you don't have to worry about TypeScript yelling at you about not having proper types because it will do that. Yes, it does come with source maps. So other than learning some ES6 language features, which we can't teach you everything, what's left? It's building your app. You already have the module loader. You already have the transpilation step. Now you can just focus on making uh, awesome apps. You know, you don't really need to worry about all the other crap that comes with this. So if you have any questions and you want to actually start trying some of this stuff out, uh, if you go to ionic.io slash two, you'll get brought to our getting started page for all our docs. I really uh, encourage you guys to check it out if you use Ionic 1 already. Uh, it's a big step forward for the framework. Uh, so thank you. Mike, looks like we have a few minutes. Do you want to take questions? Yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to take them. Why crowd today? You guys feeling a little sleepy? Need some, need some coffee? You with the awesome hat. Good hat. <laughs> right. We are currently in alpha. We're following uh, closely along with them. Uh, they are in beta 2, I believe, they just released. Uh, we're still in an alpha phase, but hopefully that'll change soon. I don't suggest shipping production-ready apps right now. Any other questions? No? Awesome. All right, awesome. Uh, Tommy? Right. So we have been doing a lot of investigation on this. Uh, I've put out a big series of videos on how you can go from an IATIC 1 app that's written in JavaScript, possibly adopt TypeScript, and take advantage of the fact that in TypeScript you can write ES6 style classes. And then as you go along and start upgrading your current V1 app, you're already taking advantage of all these features. And it's a really simple to just copy paste and uh, change a few things here and there, but you're mostly deleting code. Uh, once you start upgrade, once you take advantage of some of those features, upgrade process is not that hard. 
Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, guys.